Oh, hey, brothers and hey, sisters, welcome and go to another episode of Generation Films. Name me Karesh Alon. Now, one of the reasons why I love The Expanse is how it attempts to predict human behavior. Once we have eradicated all of the vampires and koala bears Sabaka here on Earth, we can unify ourselves and venture into the stars parasite free. Well, not so united, I guess. There's still Earth, Mars, and the Belta Loda. But even though we've taken our past grievances to the stars, ultimately most humans are good and most want peace with one another. Because space is a hard place to live and at the end of the day we are all well voila. Whether our bodies can handle the gravity wells or not, well, there's all these bone juice and grab meds, yeah. So today I want to look at Ganymede Station, one of the first permanent human settlements on the outer planets. Why Ganymede, you ask, Basman? Well, it's because right now we already have Vratna Musk trying to figure out how to colonize Mars. Nada should choke with him. Musk in Pasangwala Mall. The Vratna is crazy. He'd not care about profits. All he wants to do is to get Mars ready for colonization. Musk, you see, is a true duster. He just doesn't know it yet. So why are we talking about Ganymede bus, man? Well, it's because no one else is talking about it yet except for the Expanse. So today we'll look at what the Belt of Water have done in order to colonize this moon of Jupiter. Ganymede is the seventh satellite of Jupiter and the largest moon in the entire solar system. At around 5,200 kilometers in diameter, it's less than half the size of Earth and two and a half times larger than the moon and just a bit larger than Mars. Larger celestial bodies usually mean more favorable conditions for life. Ganymede is supposedly covered in a layer of ice, and scientists believe underneath this crust layer is a massive salty ocean. The composition of this planet is mostly rocky materials and watery ice, which means it's not as dense as most planets of its size. It also has about the same gravity as the moon, around one-sixth of Earth's gravity. This makes the world quite comfortable for space-born belters who have not developed the bone structure, musculature, or cardiovascular system for 1G planets like Earth. At the same time, 1-6 gravity still would mean that a lot of the systems in our bodies would work normally. We did an entire video on the effects zero gravity has on wounds and injuries. Basically, nothing works like it should in this environment, and gravity is needed for the healing process. Blood doesn't clot well, internal wounds don't drain, and the immune system is just utterly confused. We need some direction and some grounding. Now in Expanse, most of the ships are generating directional or rotational gravity at around 0.3 Gs. The Martians love 0.3 Gs because that's what Mars is like as well. So while the 1.6 G on Ganymede might not be perfect, it's enough to really sustain life and make life comfortable. And low gravity also gives us huge benefits during the colonization process. Less fuel is needed to land supplies and ferry individuals from larger ships in orbit. And while building new domes and facilities, it will take a lot less energy and effort to lift heavy materials and buildings. For instance, if your max yarn earth for squatting is 500 pounds, first, good for you for not just focusing on your bench and bicep curls. If you travel to Ganymede, your squat would then increase by a factor of six to close to 3,000 pounds. That's around what a Mustang weighs here on Earth. So extra strength for all of your DIY projects on Ganymede. That's great. But unfortunately, Ganymede has a very thin atmosphere, which means you'll have to wear a pressurized suit. There are some traces of oxygen, but it's not really uh, enough to sustain life. But at the same time, Ganymede is the only satellite in our solar system to have a magnetosphere. This is a protective shield that stops charged particles from reaching the surface of the moon. Ganymede's magnetosphere is most likely generated from its liquid iron core similar to Earth's. The field itself lies within the massive influence of Jupiter's own magnetosphere. Luckily, the satellite is outside of Jupiter's own radiation belt, making it a natural shelter for life. Of course, it takes a lot of technology to sustain that life. Also, it should be noted that although Ganymede does have a magnetosphere, in real life the background radiation from Jupiter would still cause a lot of issues. Ganymede would have around 8 rems of surface radiation per day. To give you a little bit of reference, the average human living at sea level on Earth is exposed to only 300 millirems per year. Now, in the expanse, we see that the Belters have built massive agricultural domes on the surface. The lack of radiation is key to the success of their farming projects here, which provide food for the entire Belter region. The crops grown would be heavily modified to survive in these harsh environments. Luckily, most plants are far more resilient than humans and complex mammals when it comes to radioactive damage. 
And this has to do with the simplicity and more flexible ways plants are built from a genetic level. Even though plant DNA is also destroyed by constant heavy radioactive exposure, there isn't as much of a natural structure to how plants grow. They don't have organs. They generally just create roots where there is space and they'll grow vegetation towards sources of light. Fertile soil would be pretty hard to find on Ganymede most likely, so it would have to actually be shipped from the inner planets, which would be very costly and ultimately not very sustainable. Although humans do generate quite a lot of feces, which could be turned into fertilizer, NASA estimates that on a two-year journey to Mars, a six-person crew will create around six tons of organic waste. Which sounds like quite a lot, but it's actually not, especially for a massive farming project. This is what 10 tons of topsoil looks like. Therefore, hydroponics would have to be the way to go. And as we see in the scenes here, that's the methods the settlers on Ganymede Station are using. They basically have something that looks like a PVC pipe, which is filled with water and a nutrient delivery system. Now remember, Ganymede does have that massive ocean beneath its surface, most likely salty water. Once we're able to access those resources, fresh water production through desalination is something definitely within our technological grasp. Not only does Ganymede have enough water to help sustain an agricultural dome, like the ones we see in the expanse, it probably has enough water to sustain the entire belt. As a matter of fact, scientists have estimated that Ganymede has more water than even Earth. Its oceans could be as deep as 60 miles, which is 10 times greater in depth than our oceans. And see guys, there's a whole solar system out there waiting for us to exploit. Now, in order to generate enough light naturally for the farming domes, giant mirrors in orbit collect light and send it towards the surface. Jupiter is quite far away from the sun, of course, but luckily it does give off its own heat. Just not enough, usually. The surface temperature on Ganymede ranges from negative 300 Fahrenheit to negative 180 Fahrenheit. We would definitely need to have some heaters inside of our habitats. Building the domes on Ganymede is actually quite difficult as well. The domes reach several stories into the sky thanks to the planet's low gravity. This is not a huge issue. But beneath the surface, the silicate crust is fragile and mobile and cannot support much weight. From our own understanding in real life, Ganymede actually might have a crust of ice that's several hundreds of miles thick. This would probably create some issues when it comes to accessing the uh, liquid water that could be found beneath the surface of the planet. This ice, of course, could still be melted into water and have its sediment and rocks filtered out to sustain some large-scale agricultural project. Ganymede Station is also one of the more popular places for expecting parents on the belt to visit. And this is because Ganymede has very low incidence of birth defects and a very low infant mortality rate. Ganymede actually has a pretty well-developed industry that caters to expecting parents, both belters and inners. The same magnetosphere that should be able to protect the plants and crops will also protect human fetuses at their most fragile and early stages. Although, as we mentioned before, the surface radiation on Ganymede is still pretty high, there would have to be structures built beneath the ice where there is natural shielding against heavy radiation. There are also a few private clinics for the super, super rich. Now, Ganymede Station is not only a great place for childbirth, it's a great place for any kind of medical uh, procedure. So it kind of serves as a retreat for anyone who is recovering from injury or disease. So while this Jovian moon is not the perfect place for humans to live, this far from Earth, it's as close as we'll get. This is why Ganymede Station is one of the oldest stations in this region of space. It might not be as large or fancy as Tycho or Circe Station, but its design reflects the very romantic nature of early human space travel. This is why Ganymede Station is not built with the cold efficiency we see that Martians cling to, or the more chaotic and haphazard method of belter construction. Ganymede Station is a product of Earth, and so the spaces in the domes are wide and open. The corridors are curved and full of light. It's a real effort by Earthers to create a home amongst the stars. And so to this day, Ganymede is still seen as a place for both inners and belters to relax in the outer planets. The Expanse takes place a few hundred years into our own future. The show obviously doesn't give us too much information on Ganymede Station, but the biggest challenge we will face other than just getting there would be the issue of radiation. Despite having a magnetosphere, Ganymede would still be too irradiated for long-term surface exposure. Humans would most likely have to burrow deep into the ice layers to really survive. 
Those agricultural domes are a possibility if plants can grow in the wasteland of Chernobyl. It's not impossible to assume that we can genetically modify plants to survive the surface radiation on Ganymede. With a bit of shielding first, of course. But then again, another one of Jupiter's moons, Callisto, could be an even better position for habitation. Its surface radiation dose is quite low at around only 0.01 rems per day, which is getting close to acceptable radiation levels for surface habitation. Callisto doesn't have a magnetosphere, but it lies in a more gentle part of Jupiter's radiation belt. Now, the real problem here is we just don't have enough information on all of these Jovian moons and, uh, you know, planets in the outer areas of our solar system. And that's because there's not enough interest, not enough research, not enough money and political will to do so. And I understand why that is, especially now where we have record high unemployment rates, a global pandemic that is keeping people trapped in their homes and isolated from one another. But still, despite the fact that it might be hard to focus on such grand and future ideas like space exploration, it remains the only way that I believe that humanity can continue to grow and avoid stagnation, which will ultimately destroy us. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below. My name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you are the protagonist.